Everyone is seated and ready. Okay. So welcome to our afternoon with Michael Marriott, uh, Rosarian extraordinaire. We are not going uh, to just find out about David Austin roses today. We're gonna to find out about the roses of the world. Um, and we also wanna thank you for being here. This is our week where we don't have a Grand Homes and Gardens program. And so we're bringing you the gardens, the, the magnificent gardens that Michael Marriott has done all over the world. Um, I want to now introduce our executive director from Morven Museum and Garden, Jill Berry. Thank you, Debbie. Welcome everyone, delighted you can join us via Zoom on our international uh, program today. So Michael is joining us from the UK and I know we have several people from around the globe joining us tonight, so thank you all. Um, here in Princeton, if you're not here, it is a sunny, beautiful day, but it is blustery and cold. So we are delighted to uh, escape to your garden, Michael. So thank you so much and we look forward to hearing it all. Okay, good. Shall I start then? Absolutely. Great, yeah. okay. Oh, well, um, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to, to talk um, this evening for me, uh, this afternoon for you. Um, it's, uh, this uh, Zoom lecturing is, is absolutely brilliant because uh, normally, of course, um, doing these lectures around the world would be, uh, it's obviously impossible at the moment, and it certainly makes life a lot easier uh, just to um, switch the computer on and uh, there you are, it's all working. So um, yeah, let's, let's start the program. Um, I mean, obviously I think roses are just <laughs> the, the best thing uh, that you can get. Um, the, I, as far as I'm concerned, they're the most garden worthy of all plants. And as I say to many people, I mean, what other plant can potentially give you the most beautiful individual bloom, um, have a fantastic fragrance, uh, flower for five or six months or more of the year, depending on your climate, uh, and uh, potentially be easy to look after. And uh, there's just no other plant that uh, can uh, even touch it for so many wonderful uh, attributes. And the other thing that, of course, is, is fantastic about the rose, uh, well, there's two other characters. One is the variability. So yeah, I'm sure you're aware roses come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes from tiny little plants that you put on your windowsill um, to great big ramblers that grow uh, tens of feet uh, up into trees. And the size of flower also can vary hugely from tiny little flowers just less than an inch across to great, one, great big ones with um, either 10 inches or more across and uh, anything between five petals and 200 petals. And uh, they have every color except true blue. And one of the most amazing things that people often don't realize is um, that apart from the tropical epithetic, epithetic orchids, I always have trouble with the word epithetic, uh, is that um, there's no other plant that has such a wide fragrance, uh, different, wide range of different fragrance types as the rose. So uh, all in all, uh, it, it's amazing from the variability point of view, but with all of that variability comes versatility. So you can mix it in all sorts of different styles of, of um, garden from the, the very intimate to the, to the large scale and from the informal to the, to the very formal. And they do amazingly well in all the different climates around the world as well. So uh, you get some roses which can cope with USDA zone three or even two, um, and others which will, will grow reasonably well in subtropical conditions. Uh, so all in all, absolutely amazing plant, nothing to touch it at all. Um, so what I want to do this evening is to start off by uh, looking at all the different ways that you uh, can plant roses in the garden. Uh, they've traditionally, they've, be, they've been I suppose mostly in the, in the 20th century, really, they've been very badly planted, I think. Um, they've, uh, the, a lot of um, roses, a lot of gardeners relied very heavily on sprays to keep them uh, healthy, and I'll deal with that a little bit later on. Um, and so varieties were bred that had very little disease resistance, you know, you had to 
be sprayed on a very regular basis to keep them healthy. Uh, and also they were planted uh, very much in formal gardens and, uh, and but planted very badly in for, formal gardens. And so the end result really was, was, was not at all uh, attractive. Uh, but nowadays, I think we're, we're, we've, we've, we've turned the corner on that from that point of view, and we plant roses uh, in much better ways and much more imaginative how to plant roses as well. So one of my very favourite ways uh, is, is perfectly shown here in this picture. Uh, it's in, not in a formal rose garden with nothing but roses, but uh, in a mixed border, so mixed up with other plants. Uh, so this garden actually is in Japan, this garden I designed in Japan, uh, near Osaka. Um, and there you've got uh, some sort of wonderful specimens of roses. On the left there, I think it's probably Cheesing Georgia. And in front of it, uh, there's the cat mint, the pita. Uh, and then the red one, more or less in the middle, I guess is probably Sophie's Rose, um, with the uh, lamb's ear, lovely silver leafed lamb's ear uh, in front of it. Uh, and then there's other roses there, as well as a snow goose on the, as a climber on the right hand side. And the great thing about um, mixing up plants uh, with roses uh, is that it, one thing, it um, breaks up that monoculture. Um, so, you know, the problem with rose gardens is that all the pests and diseases can hop from one to the other so easily. But actually, the great thing is that it, it sets the roses off really beautifully. Uh, and so that's a, a really lovely example. This is another garden uh, in England. Um, and should you be able to come across to the UK in the next year or two or, or whenever, um, and you'll want to look at some beautiful gardens, then do try and put Wynyard Hall uh, on your list. Uh, it's a fairly new garden up in the north of England. Uh, it's a four acre wall garden and uh, planted with a wonderful, wonderful mix of roses and perennials. So there you've got Lady of Shalott, uh, which is one of my very, very favorite varieties. Uh, just seems to flower and flower and flower. In our garden here at home, uh, it was still trying to flower in December uh, when it was really getting um, quite cold. So it starts in June uh, and goes right through uh, until November, December. and not the most fragrant of varieties, but on a good day, it's actually really beautiful. Uh, lovely flowers, very healthy, and altogether a, a superb variety. So because it's such a big garden, uh, then uh, all, the, all the plants are planted in fairly large groups. So there, Lady Shalott uh, is maybe, maybe half a dozen or eight or 10 plants of the same variety, planted quite closely together. Uh, to give the impression of one large mass. So you can't actually see the individual plants. Uh, it's um, it's uh, lots of plants planted around 18 inches, two feet apart, and they grow together for, to form one large mass. And in front of it is a lovely uh, geum, uh, and in front of that, the blue uh, nepeta, the catmint uh, as well. Uh, and behind the Lady Charlotte is a plant I really don't like very much, uh, is a grass. I find grass is very, very difficult to use. I, to me, the, the, most of the time, they just look too much like grass. Uh, I mean, they look fine maybe in the, in the fall and the, in the winter, but, um, but uh, during the summer, they, they, they don't excite me at all. So we'll, we'll move on from that one. Um, Princess Anne is an amazing variety. Uh, it's, um, it seems to do well in just about every climate. So again, the top picture there is at Wynyard Hall up in the north of England, doing fantastically well there, with a salvia in front of it, ribboning in front of it, uh, and the Circean to the left. Uh, and then down below is the garden again in Osaka in Japan, uh, with catmint in front of it. Does fantastically well in, in both climates. So it's, it's a really useful um, variety to consider uh, just about wherever you're living. And good winter hardiness uh, as well. One of the important things about when you're planting uh, roses with other plants uh, is to not plant them too close. Don't allow them to grow right around the base of the rose because they'll suck out all the goodness and moisture from the soil and leave little for the, for the rose. Roses like a fairly moist soil and a fairly rich soil as well. So if you've got plants growing right around the base, uh, they really won't appreciate it and they'll start sulking because perennials 
uh, you know, fairly thuggish sort of things. And if you dig one up in the middle of summer, often the soil underneath is very, very dry. And uh, catmint is a, the nepeta, um, I think you call it in the States, nepeta, do you? Uh, and it's a, it's a real thug that, and uh, it'll sort of smother things quite easily if you're not careful. This is a garden, another garden up in the north of England, Yorkshire. It actually no longer exists. It was, um, it was dug up. I had no, no hand in designing this garden. And uh, I show this one because um, there's aspects of it I really like and aspects of it I really don't like. So, uh, OK, let's, let's start off with the, the uh, character that I really do like. And so you're on the right hand side there, you've got that apricot colored crown princess Margareta looking really beautiful against the purple leaf Catinus. And then a bit further along uh, that border, you've got that uh, pink rose, which I guess is Gertrudecal, looking very beautiful in front of the silver leaved um, shrub. Uh, and then coming to uh, the left-hand side of the, of the pathway, uh, then you've got the salvia looking very lovely against the pink rose, pink rose right in the foreground. So that's what I like about it. But what I really don't like about it uh, is the fact that that uh, pathway uh, shows the, the edges is, is, is shown completely. It's a really wide pathway, and it would look to me it would have looked so much nicer if you had plants uh, spilling over the edge and breaking up that hard, hard straight line. Uh, the other thing that I really don't like about it is it, well, not so much. Is I, I would like. Personally, I would like more variety in the border. I mean, it's a big border that they've got huge areas of, of one sort of plant. So a huge area of salvia, um, huge area of uh, different roses and grasses and things like that. So if it was me, I would have um, got in about twice as many varieties as that. But of course, that's, that's personal preference. So um, uh, but that's my point of view. Of course, it's not just perennials that you can um, mix up with roses. Uh, annuals and biennials are, are lovely too. Uh, and one of my very, very favorite uh, annuals is, is this one on the left-hand side called Facilia tanacitifolia. And um, it's very readily available in the UK and around Europe. Uh, and it's actually American native, I think. Um, so I guess it's, um, it's uh, fairly freely available uh, over your way as well. Uh, Good thing about it uh, is that it grows very easily from seed. You can just scatter the seed down. It germinates very quickly. Uh, it's blue, so it goes very well with just about every colored rose. Um, it's uh, very good for the soil if you dig it in. It's got a nice little fragrance. It's good for cutting and bringing it into the house. But actually, the, the, one of the most important characters about it uh, is that actually it's um, very attractive to bees and insects. and to me, that's one of the most important things you can do uh, to, to help keep your roses as healthy as possible is to attract in as many beneficial insects as possible into your garden to help you control uh, any pests that you might have. Uh, we're lucky over here in the UK, our, our worst pest is aphid. And I know over the, your way, you have some really horrible ones like uh, Japanese beetles. So thank goodness we don't get Japanese beetles. They sound really, really bad news. Um, but it's still the basic thing to do, I think, is to attract in uh, as many uh, beneficial insects as possible, and they will help to control the, um, the pests in your garden. And birds, of course, are another very important thing um, to encourage into your garden. So Physelia is a great thing. Uh, some annuals, I think, are absolutely ghastly. Um, they, they've been completely overbred and completely ruined. Um, but there's some which are still very, so very lovely. So Cosmos is one, uh, Larkspur, um, Nigella, uh, all sorts of different things. But again, it's, it's personal taste. So there, the Phacelia is planted with Princess Alexandra of Kent, another fantastically uh, worthwhile variety. It does well in most climates around the world. A wonderful fragrance, beautiful pink flowers, and uh, flowers very, very freely as well. On the right hand side there is the pilgrim, um, which is quite a vigorous rose and so actually uh, in warmer climates it, it can easily grow as a climate. Even in the UK uh, it can grow quite easily uh, as a climber up to sort of eight or ten feet or even more. 
but if you prune it every year, you can keep it down as a shrub, but it's, it's happier as a climber. And they're looking very lovely against the uh, salvia in the background, May night. Desdemona uh, is, is an amazing variety. Um, I remember, I think it's two years ago or three years ago, I, my sister wanted a couple of plants for her garden. So I took them down to her uh, in the back of my car, about a, an hour and a half drive away. And um, a fragrance coming from the back of the car was just absolutely superb, lovely fruity fragrance. It's incredibly free flowering, uh, not too big of flowers, so medium sized. Um, but uh, very pretty and a very healthy rose as well. And looking very beautiful here with Astrantia. I always think it's, it's when you're choosing plants to go with your roses, it's always important to choose plants that uh, flower at the same time as the roses. It's, if you get something that flowers sort of three weeks before or three weeks after the rose is finished, then you, you're, you're, potential, you're, you're losing that potential um, beauty of the, of the two plants flowering at the same time. So do try and choose plants that flower at exactly the same time as the roses uh, to get that maximum effect. And when you want to try and choose plants to go with the roses, what you want, what the little trick is to offer up the flower uh, of, of, the, um, of the rose or the plant to, to, the, to the other plant and just see what it looks like. Um, so rather than planting it and finding out it's maybe the wrong plant, um, just pick a flower or two, offer it up and, and see how it looks. And some will look terrible, some will look okay, and then some will just, just uh, shine out and look really fantastic. So that's the plant you know to plant next to your rose. Of course, because roses uh, repeat flower, you've got, um, you can take advantage of the early flowering plants, the summer early summer flowering plants, uh, but also the ones that uh, flower later on in the year, in sort of September time or even October. And so the asters are a classic example of that. Uh, so here we've got one of the very best ones called Aster Monk, uh, which is looking absolutely beautiful, the Boscobel here. The Boscobel, has a, it's one of the strongest uh, Spain of all varieties, actually. It's got a really strong myrrh fragrance. And the myrrh fragrance, it's, it's nothing to do with the biblical myrrh. It's, um, it comes from the Latin name for the herb Sweet Sicily, which is Myris odorata. Uh, and it's a common, plant, common name in some parts of the country is the myrrh plant. Uh, and it smells quite aniseedy. Uh, but it's mixed in, in Boscobel, it's mixed in with a whole lot of other different fragrances as well. So altogether fascinating fragrance and really strong too. Uh, and then the white flower in the foreground there is Gara Lindheimeri, which um, flowers for a very long time, very useful plant. The, the, all the roses that I've um, been shown so, much, so far are all uh, David Austin's English roses. And you might, uh, and, and a lot of people I think, think of the Austin roses as being classically very double with lots and lots of petals, often over a hundred petals, and even up to 200 petals. But the great thing about David Austin, he, he loved all, all, um, all shapes and sizes of roses, really, uh, whether they had five petals or 200 petals, and whether it was a short plant or a tall plant or a climber. Um, what he was simply looking for um, was beauty. Uh, and you think, well, surely everybody's looking for beautiful plants to introduce. Um, but it seems not. I mean, a lot of people, unfortunately, I think, a lot of plant breeders look for novelty. And um, novelty, sadly, is not necessarily uh, something that's beautiful. And so I think uh, that is the great secret of success, actually, of the Austin Rose, is that he was, his, his, he was always striving for beautiful plants. And so, you know, in, in theory, you could get a rose that flowers non-stop, it has a fantastic fragrance, fragrance, beautiful individual flower, never gets any disease, but actually is ugly. Um, so what he was looking for was, of course, all those positive characters uh, and something that was beauty, beautiful as well. And that's why they've, they've taken off so, um, so become so popular around the world. Everybody wants, I think, uh, a beautiful plant in their garden. So this is one that he introduced a few years ago, um, tottering by gently. Uh, which, uh, when he told me that it was going to be called that, I thought, what on earth does that come from? And uh, it's a name of a cartoon 
uh, in a very posh uh, magazine uh, over in this country called Country Life magazine. And uh, it's a cartoon of, of a couple of elderly people living with their dogs in a big country house uh, out, out in the middle of nowhere and all the trials and tribulations uh, that they have. So it's a very humorous cartoon uh, and it's been going for 25 years. And so that's why it was, um, they, they named the rose for that. <clears throat> and here looking, it's a very beautiful rose, very, looking very beautiful with just that sort of daisy type um, Bufalman in the background. And the amazing thing about this rose is if you don't deadhead it, then it sets a fantastic crop of hips uh, that last right through the winter. Um, on the left hand side there is another uh, autumn picture, fall picture of uh, Roald Dahl uh, looking very lovely against the Rebecca in the background, of course, one of the, the best plants to plant uh, in the, for the autumn show. And what I always think is, is lovely about the, uh, the Austin roses is that the fact that the colours fade, and, and some people saw that as a negative character, but actually I think it's, it adds to the rose hugely. So you can see, um, sorry, that, that one on the left-hand side is Vanessa Bell, not Ragal. Uh, the, the older flowers are much paler, so the young flowers come out of a lovely soft yellow, and as they age, uh, they become uh, a creamy colour. And that range of colours, I think, is, is much nicer than if you just have a single block of one colour. And on the right-hand side is Royal Dahl. Again, it, uh, it fades. And you can see the buds there um, before they open up really strong uh, orangey apricot colour. And looking absolutely beautiful with um, geranium uh, cashmere blue, one of my very favourite geraniums because it's pure, pure blue, but once it finishes flowering, the leaves are still very lovely as well. And um, also there are the foxgloves. And so foxgloves, of course, are biennials, and it's well worth uh, looking at biennials. Uh, so you've got mullings as well, the bascoms, uh, some of the oringiums are, are biennials as well, and foxgloves. And they have this wonderful knack of being able to self-seed themselves in just the perfect place. Um, but should they sell seed themselves right around the base of the rose, then uh, it is a good idea to, to dig them up and move them somewhere else. A lot of roses are, are fairly informal and, and Tuscany Superb is a classic example. It's one of the old Gallica roses. Uh, it only flowers once, um, but it's such a beautiful rose. So I do encourage people uh, to not throw out or not to dismiss um, the once flowering roses, uh, because a lot of them are so very, very beautiful. In fact, everything else only flowers once in the garden. So why reject such a beautiful thing as a rose uh, just flowers at once? The Tuscany is superb, wonderfully rich purple um, colour, lovely velvet, uh, velvety petals. Uh, in fact, that's one of the common names of it, it's the old velvet rose. Uh, and here you can see the stems of sort of uh, flopped over, but then they're just sitting uh, on top of the lavender, looking very pretty uh, in the process. So do 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 look at some of the old roses, some of the old Gallicas and Damasks and Albers. Uh, they're so beautiful, great characters, and often have a lovely fragrance and are very tough and reliable as well. Roses can be also planted in, in hedges. Um, and I, I, I was reading that at Morven, actually, they did actually, I think they planted the hedges. It was certainly uh, suggested that they should plant a hedge at Morven. Uh, it, it, it seemed a bit uncertain whether it was actually planted, um, but it can be very effective. And here's a hedge of, of a fantastic variety called Olivia Rose Austin, which is super, super healthy and seems to do well in just about every climate around the world. It's not the most um, fragrant of varieties, but it, it repeat flowers incredibly quickly uh, and the individual blooms are very beautiful as well. Uh, it starts flowering very early in the season over here. It starts around the middle of June, but that starts the end of May and will continue uh, repeating right through until the end of the year. So if you are thinking of planting a hedge uh, of roses, do ch choose a really tough variety, otherwise you might end up with um, you know, the rose dropping its leaves badly during the summer. And th that's not so attractive. <laughs> Uh, 
you, uh, Debbie, you mentioned Kew Gardens earlier on, and this is the, the Rose Kew Gardens, which is an absolutely outstanding rose. Um, single flowers, only five petals, uh, very healthy, incredibly free flowering. Uh, and one of the things that, about it, which is very, very rare in roses, it has absolutely no thorns at all. So not even on the underside of the leaves, which is often you find on some so-called thornless roses, uh, you can stroke this, you can sort of walk inside it and you won't get prickled at all. Uh, and it's a very beautiful rose as well. So um, well worth planting in your garden uh, if you've got the space. Maybe you grow four or five feet tall. Uh, although uh, I have seen it actually, it was planted um, against a wall and it, it sent up a shoot at least eight foot tall and um, growing right up as a climber. So that's the other possibility as well. So going on to climbers and ramblers, uh, of course, there's no other, I mean, as Dave Lawson used to say, there's, the, the, the climbing and rambling roses are the best of all plants for, for covering walls, um, going over pergolas, uh, growing trees, whatever, wherever you want something to, to climb up, then roses are the, the best choice. And um, this is a picture of Constance Bride, David Austin's very first variety. Um, I mean, talk about beginner's luck, really. Uh, this variety, great big pink flowers, very double, most fantastic fragrance, uh, and really beautiful as well. And uh, this, this shot was um, uh, taken at a, a beautiful garden in the east of England called Eastern Wall Garden. And again, if you come across to the UK, do try and uh, put that up on your list uh, to visit. And I'll just very quickly tell you a little story about taking this, uh, this photograph, uh, because you'll notice there's, there's, a, there's a sheep uh, in the, uh, you can see through the gate, uh, through, through the gateway. And, uh, but what you can't see is me, um, the other side of the wall, chasing that sheep to make sure that it was in the shot. So I, um, I, I, the photographer and I have been going around taking photographs of roses around the country for over 20 years. And we have a, very a good understanding of what makes a good um, shot. So, so I find the beautiful roses and he takes the beautiful photographs. And uh, between us, we decided that would, would create the perfect a bucolic shot if we had the sheep uh, visible through that gateway. And so yes, but by a bit of um, appropriate shoeing, uh, we, we, we achieved that uh, lovely shot. So yeah, on, on pergolas as well, uh, roses look great on, on pergolas. Uh, the thing to remember on that is that actually most ramblers have fairly lax growth and so are great for growing up and over and growing horizontally, uh, whereas climbers on the whole have rather stiff growth. So trying to train a stem of a climber to go horizontally is often not all that easy. Um, so. What they've done here, uh, this is the David Austin Garden in the UK, uh, is planted a climber and a rambler up each of the pillars. So the climber is encouraged to just cover the vertical section of the pillar, uh, and then the rambler uh, goes, shoots up very quickly because it's more vigorous and goes over the top uh, and is, uh, just hangs down in beautiful festoons. And the mixture of the large flowers and the small flowers looks um, very pretty together. So again, this is uh, another part of the David Austin garden. So you've got um, roses, climbing roses, growing up pillars and growing horizontally uh, at the back of a lovely mixed, uh, a border of, uh, informal border of just roses. And at the front. So you're looking at that photograph, you think, well, that, that must be a box hedge at the front, um, but in boxwood. But in fact, it's you, um, Taxus Bacata, and you normally think of you growing maybe, you know, four, five, six, ten feet or more tall, but um, they, they've planted that, uh, we planted that at the nursery over 30 years ago, uh, and just by keeping it trimmed once or twice a year, uh, it's kept nice and short and uh, is a really good, tough variety. Bo Boxwood in this country is suffering very badly from both the um, blight and the caterpillar. Whereas you, as long as it's reasonably well drained soil, uh, is absolutely as tough as old roots. So the shrub rose is there, uh, a lovely mix of different colours. Uh, the, 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 
the wonderful thing about the Austin roses is that uh, none of them really are, are really strong, strident colours. Um, they, a lot of them are rather softer pastel shades, or if they are stronger colours, then they're not so really hard colours. And um, somebody once described them as, as like natural dyes as opposed to artificial dyes. And so the advantage of that, you can put almost any two Austin roses together uh, and they won't clash. Whereas you do the same with a hybrid tea or floribunda and you often end up with a, a really nasty clash of colors. Um, so here, um, the, trying to identify the rose, I think the yellow one on the left there is probably Imogen. Uh, and then the sort of slightly apricot colored one is one of my favorite varieties for fragrance is Lady Emma Hamilton. Uh, and uh, whenever I encourage people to smell that rose, they always come up with a smile on their face because uh, it's a, obviously very uh, accessible fragrance. It's very strongly fruity fragrance and often of tropical fruits like guavas and lychees. So uh, really beautiful, beautiful fragrance. And the next one along, I would guess, is uh, one called Young Lycidas. Um, um, and uh, which is a rather lovely uh, purple sort of color. The client is behind, got that pink one in the corner, the deep pink one, I think it's Alexandre Giraud. Uh, I'm not sure what the other ones are. Probably the pink one on the right is Paul's Himalayan Musk. And uh, that's a huge rose, um, much happier to grow up way up into a tree, sort of 20, 30 feet up into a tree than trying to be constrained on a pergola like that. You, you often read that uh, there's a, this very specific list of roses that have to be grown uh, on north walls, but I think a lot of that is, is not at all accurate. Uh, and as long as you've got a, a nice open facing north wall uh, with no extra shade from trees or anything like that, you can, <coughs> you can plant most, variety, most climbing varieties on that. And certainly most Austin roses uh, seem to grow quite happily on an, an open north facing wall. So they are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, well, there on the right hand side is um, the variety of the Pilgrim. That actually was taken several years ago now, so it's, it's gone quite a lot tall and going right up to the, um, up to the gutter line. And always covered in flowers uh, every summer. And then on the left hand side, is that Lady Charlotte again, the one that I was talking about earlier on, um, growing on south facing wall. So that is quite a vigorous variety. You can either grow it as a fairly tall shrub, five, six feet, something like that. Um, or you can grow it as a really wonderful, wonderful climber up to sort of eight feet or so. Uh, it's just exactly the same plant. It's not different, uh, not like iceberg, bush and climber. It's just um, how you prune it and train it. And I always think this is uh, photograph is, is rather amazing. Um, just a number of flowers on those plants and, and the first flowers so low on the ground. Um, so you've got the, on the growing tumbles on the right hand side there, you know, the first flowers are actually sitting on the, uh, on the gravel. And the same with the Crown Princess Margaret on the left hand side of the window as well. And so that, the, the Austin climbers have this natural ability to produce flowers all the way up from top to bottom, whereas a lot of the old hybrid tea climbers, they um, tended to produce, tend to just produce one or two stems from the base and then uh, all the flowers and leaves are sort of six foot up in the air and it really doesn't produce a very uh, attractive effect. Gertrude Jekyll, you, you may know, um, just the most wonderful fragrance. Uh, it's been voted several times as the country's favorite rose in, in over here in the UK. The fragrance is, is the classic old rose fragrance. Uh, absolutely wonderful. It's, it's I mean, what I think everybody expects a rose to smell like. And I always think when that uh, variety Gertrude Jekyll starts flowering in summer, then I know that summer has finally arrived because the individual blooms are absolutely fantastic, very, very beautiful. Uh, and the fragrance, as I said, it's, it's just, oh, it's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, Generous Gardener on the, on the right-hand side there, it's, it's sort of similar fragrance, 
a um, bit more sort of uh, fruity uh, tea rose type fragrance, but still quite old rose. Uh, one of my very favorite varieties, uh, lovely, lovely individual blooms, soft pink, uh, and very healthy, grows quite vigorously up to 10, 12 feet, quite without too much difficulty. And if you don't deadhead it, um, then it produces the most fantastic crop of hips that will last right through the winter. And it was interesting this last year because uh, all of the gardeners at the David Austin Garden Bar One were furloughed. Uh, he didn't have any time to deadhead at all. And so uh, come the winter, this uh, variety of generous garden was just covered in uh, these beautiful, very large, orangey red hips that lasted right through the winter. So it's it's worth trying to do that sometimes uh, because I think the hips are a wonderful plant, a wonderful asset to the plant uh, and uh, the, uh, the birds absolutely love it as well. One of the golden rules about um, choosing a climber for a situation is to not be impatient. Um, people often say, oh, I want that, that climber to cover the wall or the obelisk or the arch or something like that quickly. Uh, and of course, if you choose a vigorous variety, it will, it will cover it quickly, but then it'll just carry on going. You know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it's in its genes to grow into a big rose. So when you're choosing a, a climber uh, for a certain situation, then just do measure uh, what height you want it to grow to and then choose a variety that is appropriate to that size. Uh, so Crown Princess Margareta here is, is perfect for that size. It's easy to keep under control as a result. It flowers, producing lots of flowers all the way up from top to bottom and looking really beautiful. This actually is in our, in our own garden uh, at home here. It's, this is the Adelaide d'Orléans, one of my very, very favorite varieties. Uh, it's a, quite a vigorous rambler, probably not the best choice for these arches because it's, it's sort of overwhelming it a bit. Um, but I, it's just such a beautiful rose. Um, it doesn't repeat flower, it doesn't have much fragrance, it doesn't set hips, but it's still such a worthwhile rose um, to grow. Uh, and certainly in this climate, actually, uh, in the UK, it's, it's evergreen. It, it doesn't get any disease at all, so the leaves stay on all, th all through the winter. So rather than having lots of um, bare stems all through the winter, you've got, still got a lovely green covering of the uh, garden to, to visit. Uh, over here in the UK is Woolerton Old Hall, which is not far from the David Austin Garden. Um, it, the the, the colour association uh, in that garden, the, the different styles of gardens, they have it's separated up into about eight or ten different gardens, uh, garden areas, each one quite different from the other. Uh, and it's just uh, such a superb garden and, and very, very well maintained as well. And also, of course, very important to when you're visiting gardens is they serve delicious teas and cakes and lunches as well. Uh, so this is another of my very favorite varieties called Francis E. Lester, uh, which I believe was an American variety. Uh, and so single flowers, rather like a dog rose, um, only flowers once, but that's not, not, uh, not to be worried about. Lovely fragrance, lovely musky fragrance. Uh, and then each of those flowers is, um, changes into a lovely little orange hip that lasts right through the winter. Um, so very, very worthwhile variety. Um, I was gonna say, so, oh yes, the musk fragrance um, is, uh, is, is very different to the other fragrances uh, in that um, it's produced from the, um, stamens of the flower. So all the other fragrances, the, the fruity fragrance, the old rose fragrance, um, uh, the uh, myrrh fragrance uh, and the tea fragrance all come from the petals of the flowers, whereas the um, musk fragrance comes from the stamens of the flowers. And you find that most commonly in, in the ramblers, which produce thousands and thousands of, of small flowers. And the musk fragrance um, wafts on the air uh, very easily. So even though the old rambler might be several yards away, you can still smell it. 
So this, this is an example of, um, of where to plant a rose and where not to plant a rose. This is a fantastic variety called Rambler Recta, uh, little semi-double flowers, fantastic fragrance. Uh, so if you grow it up into a tree, then absolutely superb, although this is up into a, a not very big apple tree and I think it'll likely to kill off the apple tree before too long. So you want a big tree actually, not a small tree. Um, but growing up the front of the house is, is not to be recommended uh, because I mean that's probably only a three or four year old plant. So it's already absolutely uh, I mean, looking superb, but it'll just carry on growing and growing and growing. So we've got to remember that climbers and ramblers growing up walls need to be uh, attached to the wall, they need to be as well possibly. Uh, and um, so quite a lot of maintenance and just got to think how high up a set, a set of ladders you want to go. And you can see it's got its eye on that open window in the bedroom and so it will be coming in the middle of the night and tickling you behind the ear. So. Uh, so choose the appropriate vigor of variety um, for, for your position. You can also grow them in pots. Um, and so if you've got a, a paved area, a terrace area, something like that, where you can't grow anything in the ground, then a rose in a pot is a great way of bringing fragrance and color uh, close to where you're sitting. The secret of growing roses in pots is, is that you've got to be willing to water them very, very generously, uh, especially in your climate. So um, do make sure to give them lots and lots of water uh, and then feed them well as well. So even though uh, this looks a bit crowded, uh, if you look after them well enough, then you can plant um, climbers in pots as well. Uh, so you know, if you've got a wall and you can't plant anything uh, at the foot of the wall, then you can plant a climber in the pot and uh, make it look very good. So imagine if it was a climber on the wall, you'd be able to uh, fan the stems out to, to uh, cover a bigger area. I love um, the wild roses, the, the simplicity of the wild roses. And um, North America has some beautiful examples um, of, of wild roses, um, the Virginiana and um, the Tida, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head. Um, but they beautiful single flowers, and because they are wild roses, then um, they they're followed by hips. They, they all of them do set hips, and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. You know, some are tiny, like forest yarn is quite small. Some are great big ones, like Rosa rugosa. Um, all sorts of different colours. Some are bright red, uh, some are orange, uh, some yellow, uh, some of them are black. The Scots roses are, have black hips uh, and all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So um, it's a great thing about the wild roses is that they have the beautiful flowers in the summer and then the fantastic hips in the autumn. If you choose the right variety, it'll last uh, right through the winter. Uh, and uh, you don't need to, do, you, should, well, you shouldn't do anything to them. I mean, if you start pruning them, you're actually spoiling them. So um, plant them where there's plenty of space to realize their potential uh, and then um, don't prune them uh, at all. Just leave them be and then just admire them uh, each year. It'd be wonderful plants. Rosa rugosa uh, is, is a wonderful species. It's native to uh, northern Japan, uh, northern uh, coasts around northern China, Siberia, North Korea. So you can imagine super, super cold winters there, um, but it'll, it will withstands such cold temperatures. It never gets any disease. Uh, and if you start spraying it actually, then you're doing more harm than good. Uh, the roses it actually repeat flowers. Uh, they have the most beautiful old rose fragrance and then also set this wonderful crop of big cherry tomato-like hips. So wonderfully worthwhile variety to grow. And there's lots of different hybrids of it as well, um, which some of them, not all of them are very healthy, but quite a few of them, and a lot of them have a fantastic fragrance. And my very favorite of them is one called Cancer. Here you see Rosa complicata, not a true species, but a close species hybrid, looking very beautiful in the wild area. Uh, set well back from the driveway, looking beautiful with oxide daisy and uh, wild grasses there. 
and it's Alba Maxima, not a wild rose, but fairly close relative to a wild rose, but not, not truly wild. Uh, but I, I guess that's never been pruned and it's just created this lovely sort of lumpy, bumpy effect. Tree roses, uh, I find quite difficult. They're, they're sort of the complete opposite, really, to, um, to the wild roses. Uh, they're, they're grafted onto a, a stem, so it's a great way of uh, creating instant height. So the stem's usually about sort of three foot tall. Uh, I always think the stems are, are, are not very attractive, and so it's best to try and hide the stem uh, as much as possible. So maybe, you know, up to two thirds, three quarters of the way up, have something else growing around it to hide the stem, but you still get the uh, extra effect of the, of the height there above everything else. And this is what, uh, this is looking very effective here. You can see the tree roses there lined up on the other side of the bed and creating that extra height to line the pathway going down the middle. And really finally, I come to, to the formal rose garden, which I was you know, quite rude about. Um, earlier on in my talk, uh, because they can often look absolutely dreadful. But actually, if it's planted well and got good varieties and it's well maintained, it can be really beautiful. And, you know, no other plant is going to give you so much colour for such a long time. Um, so this is a, a lovely little formal garden that I designed many years ago in the UK. Uh, so just classic um, design, four beds with a central fountain. Each, variety, each bed has about four varieties in it, and all nicely color coordinated. And I think that's really lovely, actually. And the other thing to notice there is that the roses are planted quite closely together. So um, you, you, can only, you can't really see any bare soil in between. So I think it's very important getting the planting distance uh, right. So that you really don't want to see any bare soil in between the roses at all. But formal gardens can come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, and this is at the David Austin Garden in the UK uh, with a lovely serpentine effect and the, the edging of um, box. Each, each bed has its own variety. Or more informal um, uh, planting purely roses. Uh, and uh, so you see you can get different heights uh, and then you can get varieties that um, produce flowers right down to ground level. There, the, the color scheme has been uh, kept fairly narrow, so that it goes from white to soft pink to sort of deep pink or, or purple. Um, there is a hint of yellow there, the, the climber at the back there. But it's always a, a tricky one to decide whether to, uh, what color scheme to use, whether you're going to, to try and widen it up and introduce the yellows and apricots, or whether just to limit it to sort of shades of, of pink and red and white. And that's very personal. Some people, for some reason, really don't like uh, yellow flowers. I can never understand that at all. I think it's very strange that you shouldn't like um, yellow flowers or yellow roses. I think they're, they're very lovely. Um, but as I said, the, the, the softer colors of the Austin roses, uh, you can still mix them in very effectively uh, and it can still look very beautiful. And of course, very important to do any rose garden is a seat. So you've got the seat there in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, always a good place to sit and admire the roses and uh, taking the beautiful fragrances as well. So, okay, let's, let's just tell you about how all the different ways you can use roses in the garden. Let's do a little bit of work on, on the best way of, of caring for them. And one of the most important thing actually is just, just choosing a good variety. And, and uh, because there's all there's, well, there's thousands of roses on the market uh, and they've been bred in different parts of the world. Uh, and so some varieties will be perfectly suited to your climate. Others will, will hate your climate or you know, they won't survive the winter. So uh, on the left-hand side there, you've got General Shabrikin, which is a tea rose, um, which uh, hates the English weather basically. Uh, it'd be very happy in California or Adelaide in Australia, but uh, in a normal sort of coolish, rather wet climate, uh, it, you know, it's just not worth growing at all. Uh, on the right hand side there, you've got the most beautiful uh, deep red rose, the Dark Lady, uh, which gets black spot very, very easily. So again, not a good variety, especially if you don't want to spray in a wet climate like here in the UK, 
but in a dry climate, uh, just looks absolutely superb. So do some research, make sure that the variety you choose is good for your climate. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, you, you, you ask people, uh, Rosarians, expert people, local people is the important thing. Um, in the American Rose Society, you have consulting Rosarians. I think you can ask them uh, for advice. But if you're, if you're keen on not spraying your roses at all, which I think is a very good idea, then do be sure that, uh, that what advice they are giving you uh, is for roses uh, that haven't been sprayed. So yeah, choose a variety that is a very good and tough one. So here's a couple of really good varieties that are really tough and healthy uh, and should do well in, in most climates, uh, certainly around the States and, and around Europe and many parts of the world too. So Olivia Rose Austin, we looked at before, uh, very, very healthy. Uh, and very free flowering. Vanessa Bell also uh, a very healthy rose, a very free flowering in, just, in most climates around the world. The other important, very important thing when when uh, or planting rose garden is to look after your soil. Um, people, I think, tend to not think of soil being very important, but actually, of course, it's absolutely crucial. If there wasn't a decent soil, then we wouldn't be able to grow crops, we wouldn't be able to grow flowers, and the whole, uh, well, we, we wouldn't last very long, and, and neither would any animals. So plants are the basis of life on this planet, uh, and they grow basically in soil. And so you've got to look after your soil to make sure they grow as well as possible. And the way to do that, as a starter, uh, is to add in a good quantity of, of organic matter into the soil. And this comes in all sorts of different forms. This is the one that we have locally to here in the UK. Uh, soil Improver, it's a lovely mix of uh, composted bark and, and um, cattle manure, uh, but it can be garden compost, uh, it can be horse manure. Uh, just whatever you mix into the soil before planting, make sure it's well rotted and preferably free from weed seeds and uh, perennial weeds as well. So that's a very important part uh, is to uh, improve the soil before you plant. Then once you've planted it, then uh, you should um, uh, feed it probably twice, if not three times a year with some sort of rose fertilizer. And um, often in the States that you need to water your rose as well. You think, well, watering is watering, that's dead easy, dead easy you know, there's, there's nothing to it, but actually there is. And uh, um, if you overwater plants, uh, then that can result in poor growth. Uh, it can also result in uh, getting bad disease. So if you water uh, too early in the morning or, or late in the evening, then that's actually the best way of encouraging black spot. Because if the leaves stay wet for too long, and black spot will actually love it and you get um, very bad uh, black spot as a result. On the other hand, if the, uh, if the soil gets too dry, then that will encourage powdery mildew. So if you do want to water, then best to water sort of in the morning sometime, maybe after the leaves have dried off from the dew overnight. Uh, and uh, but if you water in the morning, you get the leaves get wet and the leaves will dry out quite quickly and you're not encouraging black spot. Uh, hopefully you don't want to spray, um, but you know, sometimes uh, it's inevitable, but uh, try and avoid um, true fungicides if you can. Uh, maybe look at uh, foliar feeds uh, as an alternative. So you're trying to boost the plant's uh, immunity and that, that often will work very well. But different varieties are hugely different in their ability to fight off diseases. So the starting point in getting a healthy rose is to choose a really good variety. So then it comes on to pruning. Well, pruning, people get so worried about pruning. You know, they, 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 they just don't know, they get confronted with rose and they completely freeze up. Whereas really it's, the, it's very easy. Um, and the easiest thing to, to instruction, and if you just do this, you're really 75% of the way there, is literally cut it down to halfway. And if that's all you do, uh, then you know, that, that will produce a good result. The other important thing is to, to look at the plant. If you see any dead or diseased stems in there, then cut them out. 
And then the other very important thing, once your rose getting a few years old, is to look critically at stems. And then some of them are a bit old and tired, then cut them out to uh, encourage new young growth from the base. Uh, and, but then you, once you get a bit more experience, a bit more confident, um, then start looking at the shape of your bush. Uh, and some of them are much more upright now, some are much more relaxed growth. So Litchfield Angel here, you can see it's got sort of fairly relaxed growth. Um, so when you prune it, try and work uh, in sympathy with that. Whereas if a rose is much more upright, then you're going to prune it in a very different way to that. So you wouldn't want to trim that up too much, uh, work, as I say, with it. So here's a picture of, of pruning roses in winter. Um, the, the picture on the left is before pruning. The roses would have flowered about head height. Uh, and you can see the bottom is quite crowded with lots of stems. And on the right hand side is the rose uh, after flowering, uh, uh, after pruning, sorry. And quite a few of the stems at the base have been pruned out uh, to just leaving the younger ones. And then you see those, that stem coming up, goes up about sort of two feet and then branches out. And that's where the stem comes from came, uh, that produced the flowers in the previous year. Uh, and so they've just been reduced back down to maybe three or four buds or six inches, something like that. It's not critical at all. Um, so the important thing, uh, when you're pruning a rose is to, to before you start, is what, ro what do I want that rose to do in that position? Because it might be growing in a different place and you might want to do something very different. So that's all it is. And uh, people worry about, you know, you see all these instructions about pruning to an out of pointing bud and pruning just above uh, the bud and at an angle and all that sort of thing. Really, I don't worry about any of that at all. I mean, you can do, still do it if you want. But to me, it's a, it's a bit of a waste of time uh, and uh, I can prune a lot more roses by just uh, ignoring all those things, which to me uh, doesn't worry, it doesn't matter at all. Here's a close up of, of um, other roses that have been pruned and then you can see um, how the young buds are shooting out. So the side shoots have been pruned back to sort of three, four buds, about four, five, six inches and all shooting like mad and produce, will produce the flowers um, this year. Um, climbing roses pruned exactly the same way, except that the stems are sort of uh, further up from the ground. So you're just pruning the previous year's flowering shoots back to a few buds uh, to encourage more side shoots and uh, so more flowers this year. And then try and fan the stems out um, to cover the area. So the more horizontal they are, the more uh, side shoots will be produced and the more uh, flowers you'll get as a result. And also it will help to decrease the vigor of the rows. And if, you're, if you've got a rambler, which is very lax growth, um, then uh, you can hopefully twizzle the stem around the pillar uh, or on the right-hand picture there, uh, it, it, you'll get a lot more flowers on stems that go horizontally than ones with the grow vertically. So always try and uh, train the stems horizontally or, or fan them out to encourage as many flowers as possible. And then the other wonderful, wonderful thing to do with roses, of course, is to pick them and bring them in the house. And it doesn't have to be a great big fancy arrangement. It can just be uh, just one stem in a vase, like in the middle, the middle vase there, it can just be two, three roses with just a few little perennials picked at random, or not at random, but chosen to go with the roses. Or it can be just a lovely little posy like that, um, or Jubilee celebration, that one with, I think, fantastic fragrance from the rose, or, or something a bit fancier still, uh, with just an arrangement in white. So there you are. Uh, I hope that's encouraged you to, um, to plant more roses in the garden uh, and also um, convince you that uh, roses actually are very easy to look after and just the, the best of all garden plants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. This was bravo. I, I, I know I'm 
swooning over all these beautiful roses. Um, and we have so many questions here. Uh, first, I want to just tell you there are people from all over the world. And uh, I asked, you know, to say where you're from and what your favorite rose was. So at the end, I'll give you a little list of where people are from and what their favorite roses are. But we'll start right now with uh, some questions. So um, any suggestions on best roses if you have deer issues or what to do? Oh, deer are a real problem. Um, yeah, they can really ravage roses really badly. I found that actually the Rugosa roses and other roses that are really thorny, um, the deer don't like them too much at all. So it's worth trying those. And then the other, um, I, we don't have, luckily I don't, we don't have deer here at home. Uh, they're not very far away, but they never, they've never come into this garden. Um, but what um, somebody suggested, which seems like a very good idea, is to stretch a fishing line across where they come in because they can't see it uh, and then they press against it and they, they, they get confused about it and they go off um, somewhere else. So that's so as long as you don't go and um, decapitate yourself on the fishing line, then I think that might be worth trying. Oh, great suggestions. Uh, so next question, what made David Austin so special? Is there anyone today who you would say is the next David Austin? It, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question that um, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier on. I think what the answer is actually he, he, when he wanted to um, uh, introduce roses, what he was looking for was beauty. Uh, you know, he, he didn't want just necessarily maximum uh, flowering capacity or maximum health. He wanted his roses to obviously be healthy and free flowering. But what he's really, really after was, was a beautiful rose. And I think that's the great secret of um, success uh, of the Austin roses. As to, the, as to somebody who's um, uh, a replacement for the Austins, I mean, obviously the, the, the Austins are still producing new varieties and I'm sure that will go on for a very long time and uh, it's producing very beautiful ones. There's a, quite a few other breeders around the world that are producing roses that are very similar to the Austin roses. Um, in terms of the bloom, shape of the bloom. But I think it's um, what, what often um, distinguishes them is that actually the growth habit is, uh, is not so attractive. And that's what uh, David Austin was, was very keen on, is, is how the rose was held on the bush. Interesting, thank you. Uh, what is your all-time favorite rose and why? <laughs> uh, it's such an impossible question. <laughs> Uh, I, I suppose I have several really. Um, I mean, I suppose Generous Gardener is one of my favorites because it's so so fragrant, uh, such a soft color, very healthy, and then it produces the hips as well. Uh, Munstead Wood is another of my favorites, such a lovely deep, really purple color, and again, a fantastic fragrance. Um, Desdemona, another one I mentioned earlier on. I, I, and, the, and then there's, uh, there's things um, like the Adelaide Dolly on the Rambler and the Francis E. Lester. Uh, and Lady Charlotte is, is, a, is another one. I think the, the common factor on all of those actually, except for Adelaide Dolly, is fragrance. I think uh, unless a rose has a good fragrance, then it has to be absolutely exceptional and uh, other characters. I think fragrance is just absolutely crucial part uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a rose, whether a rose is good or just all right. Thank you. Okay, next one. How did you become a rosarian? Are there many others in the world? And what's the career path for someone who loves roses? Um, I, I, mean, I, was, I suppose I was very lucky because I joined David Austin's um, 35 years ago. And, um, you know, grow nothing but roses. So I was able to just uh, concentrate all my efforts towards just looking at roses. I mean, I've, I'm passionate about all plants and gardens, really. Um, but uh, I particularly love roses and, and spent, obviously, more or less eight hours a day um, or more working with them uh, and meeting lots of other rose enthusiasts uh, around the world. Um, so what's the career path? You've just got to try and make roses your life really, you know? So how do you do that? I don't know. I, I say I was very lucky because um, Dave Lawson's would be one of the very few rose nurseries around the world or practically the only one really that could really afford to employ me for 
just been an enthusiastic um, rosarian and designing rose gardens uh, and also just being the front person of the nursery. So I suppose one way would be maybe you you get to look after a rose garden um, somewhere or, or look after a garden. Part of it is lots of roses and just really get into roses and start lecturing uh, and learning as much about them as possible. Um, thank you. So next question, what are some gardens you've created in the US? Um, practically all of the gardens I created in the US are, are private gardens, everything from sort of small borders to, to more substantial ones and uh, scattered all around the US. Um, I haven't done many public gardens really. One I did actually was um, at a casino um, uh, just outside San Diego. Um, we were, it was, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. We were trying to uh, establish what roses did well in different climates uh, around the US. And so did that by either doing proper test beds or, or planting up gardens. And so one of the ones I did, as I say, was, was down in San Diego. And that was, uh, that was pretty successful on the whole. Um, I've advised on a few gardens sort of like in, in Portland uh, and uh, the Rose Garden in Portland and then the um, uh, Peggy Rockefeller Garden in New York Botanical Garden um, and also actually the American Rose Society headquarters in Louisiana. I, I did some work down there as well, but practically all the work I've done for private gardens really. Very good, thank you. So, uh, okay, so what is your favorite tool for pruning roses? Do you have a favorite selection for gloves as well? Uh, I, I very, very rarely wear gloves. I hate wearing gloves on the whole. <laughs> um, so uh, I, can't, I can't comment about that. I mean, sometimes I regret it and, and get scratched quite badly. But uh, after spending so many years looking after roses, I've learned to, uh, to work with them and uh, generally don't get too scratched at all. Uh, as to secateurs, I love the Felco secateurs. And there's the number two secateurs, which are fairly substantial, or slightly smaller ones, which I really like. Also, the number sixes, which fit much more comfortably in the pocket. So that's, uh, yeah, those are my favorite uh, tools for roses. Insider tips, cool. Uh, and any basic, uh, any other basic tool recommendation for a rose lover? Um, a, a good pair of loppers is sometimes useful if you've got a you know, really big old stem. Um, but really, I mean, that's, that's uh, I'm just very occasionally a little handsaw or something like that. But that's, uh, that's all you need, really, because the, the sectors are for both pruning and deadheading during the summer. Uh, and then the, um, the loppers and the saws for, for, um, for pruning in winter. So, yeah, that's, that's all you need, really. And uh, the next question, you may have answered in this, but uh, what is the most fragrant, longest blooming rose? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that one. Um, I think it's probably Desdemona. It, it was, was, um, was it's probably one of the very best from that point of view. I talked about it earlier on, as I said, taking a couple of plants down to my sister in the car. Uh, and, but outside in the, in the garden, it's sort of fantastic fragrance. It flowers over a very long season, flowers very freely and very pretty too. So I think that's, that's probably a, a top contender. And there's a couple of uh, actually questions kind of combined. So naming roses, how did that start? Who decides on a David Austin name? Um, and then the, uh, part of this also, what about when a person a rose is named after falls out of favor? Yes, uh, it, it does happen, of course. Um, and over here, we've got a um, probably the best known of the garden TV um, presenters is called Alan Titchmarsh. And we named a rose for him many years ago, but really actually it's uh, not all that good a rose. Um, and it happens and that's, that's the, da the danger you name them after famous people and uh, it turns out not to be such a, a good rose. It's very, trialing roses is very tricky really, you, you sort of, we, we Austin and just about uh, every other breeder, they'll, they'll trial them for about 10 years before they're introduced with it. And you can be confident that it's a good rose, but you don't really find out how, how good a rose it is until it's been you know, grown in gardens for another three or four or five years, really. So it, it's a, a tricky one, uh, that. Um, how we name roses? 
uh, David Austin always used to say it had to be a, a name that rolled off the tongue nicely. Um, so, so, you know, some varieties are giving just harsh names. You've got to think about a, what a rose is. You know, it's something that's very beautiful, often has a lovely fragrance. Uh, and you just want to give it a, a name that sort of goes with that uh, sort of character. You don't want to give it some sort of hard name. So uh, the, the problem is that we name roses for all around the world. So it's, ideally it needs to be a, a name that just about every nationality in the, in the world can, can pronounce easily, which is not, not always very um, easy to do at all. Well, um, so it, it, takes, it, it takes a lot of <clears throat> thinking about uh, naming roses uh, because not only do we uh, has to sound nice, it also has to um, be accepted by the legal fraternity. So because we protect our roses, uh, we trademark them, then uh, the lawyers get involved and they, they put all sorts of ridiculous rules and regulations about what a name a rose can and cannot be named. <coughs> Is there a Michael Marriott rose? And if not, if you could name one, what would it be? And that, you know, Michael Marriott rolls off the tongue. That's easy, right? So uh, if you could name one, what would it be? Uh, no, there isn't one. Um, gosh. Um, I, I mean, I, I love most of the Austin rose. So it, it would have to be an Austin rose style of uh, flower. But that said in the, in the lecture, it can be either five petals or it can be sort of 200 petals. So, um, yeah, it just has to be something that's beautiful uh, and fragrant and healthy. So you're not not going to pick one, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so another question here: Can every rose be grown in a pot? Um, yes, um, as long as the pot is big enough. So if you've got a, a very big rose, then it's going to need a um, relatively big pot. Um, so, you know, if it's a really, really big, big rose, then you're going to struggle to find a pot big enough. Uh, if you feed and water them well enough, then you can get away with a you know, fairly small pot. But then if you sort of don't water it, you know, for two or three days, and it's hot weather, then it could be fairly disastrous. So, um, yeah, do, do make sure to get up. There's pots that we use at the nursery there. I think they're about 18 inches, two foot across by about the same deep. So it's best to err on the side of having a, a bigger rather than a smaller pot. And, and overwintering them in a pot? Well, in this climate, it's no problem at all um, because we don't have hard enough winters. Uh, but where you are, what are you, zone six or something like that, are you? Yes, we're zone six. Yeah, I, mean, I think what a lot of people do in, um, in that sort of climate is they bring them indoors into an unheated garage um, over winter and it doesn't matter if it's dark or completely unheated and if they get completely frozen what tends to kill off um, plants during the winter uh, things like roses is that the stems get dehydrated through um, the wind blowing through them because the, the water is frozen it's not accessible to the plant uh, and then they just get dehydrated during the winter so if you bring them indoors even though it's still very cold um, then they, they don't get dehydrated and they survive better. Thank you. Uh, we have quite a few more questions and I think we're running into, uh, we've been, been up, taking up a lot of your time. We're already at quarter after, but um, we have a lot of uh, rose replant disease questions and beetle questions. So those are a little specific. Um, I don't know, do you want to address those or should we, you know, um, I was listening to, there was a lecture by Mark Wyndham um, uh, about a whole range of pests and diseases. He, he was talking uh, from the American Rose Society, very interesting. Uh, he was talking, one of the things he was talking about was Japanese beetle. And he was saying, um, what you don't want to do is to squash them because then that releases smells that attracts in more beetles. Um, and also just the fact of the beetle eating the flowers or the leaves um, again sends out a signal to other beetles you know that there's some delicious food here so if, if you do best way of controlling them uh, is by uh, knocking them into a, a bucket of, of soapy water uh, in in the morning before they start feeding 
uh, and that will help to prevent uh, other beetles joining their, um, their, their brothers. Um, in terms of replant disease, um, it's very much an English thing that a British thing. And uh, so I, one of the, it seems to be not so much a problem in the States. And I think part of the reason for that is that, that uh, American gardeners um, mulch their soil much more free than, than we do uh, in this country. And so what they do as a result is that the soil is, is in a much healthier state. Uh, it's got a, many more uh, fungi and bacteria and insects growing in it, which helps to keep it nicely in balance. Whereas if you don't mulch your soil at all, then, uh, then the, um, the uh, pathogenic fungi and bacteria can uh, start becoming dominant uh, and cause problems. And when you do try and plant a rose uh, in, old, in old soil that hasn't been maintained properly, uh, then you're, you're asking for problems. So the secret behind it is to look after your soil really well by mulching uh, each year. Um, we're going to take the last question because we may have to invite you back for all these extra questions here. Um, I just want to do the last question because this person wrote to us um, yesterday. How close can you plant shrubs of different rose varieties together? Uh, it depends very much on, on the size of the variety or how vigorous it is. Uh, as a general rule for the Austins in this climate in the UK, then we plant them between 18 inches and two feet apart. Uh, between plants of the same variety and then that grows together to form one large mass and then between plants of different varieties usually about sort of three feet um, but it depends very much on the variety because of course some Austin varieties are much more vigorous than others some have, uh, some have arching growth some like Queen of Sweden are, are much more upright um, so you just got to that's a very general rule so then you just got to uh, look at the variety itself and then uh, alter it uh, as necessary and of course that will vary also in your climate so if you're in a warmer climate then you have to space them a little bit further apart because they tend to um, grow more vigorously in a warmer climate than they would in, in somewhere like the UK so yeah between 18 inches and two feet is a good general rule but um, uh, open to uh, what your local conditions are like. Well thank you and I just since we did ask everyone in the chat I just want to give you a quick run through here. We've got people on today from Northern Ireland, Scotland, Britain, British Columbia, Tasmania, United States, all a variety of states, uh, Canada, another Canadian, and their favorite roses range from Olivia Rose Austin, Darcy Bristol, Lady of Shalott, Golden Celebration, Abraham Darby, L Wallerton Old Hall, Fragrant Cloud, Duchesse de Provence, our R. Munstead Wood, Constant Spry, Anna Pavlova, New Dawn um, Climber, Fairy, Iceberg, Tuscany Superb, Julia's Rose, and Crocus Rose. And so I guess what this tells us is there are as many different kinds of roses and rose lovers as there are people and countries. And you were right, you hit on every, everyone loves roses, right? There's nothing you can't love about roses. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, very interesting to hear all the different people from around the world and all the different varieties. Yes, I mean, some. I personally don't like the hybrid teas very much, but some people absolutely love them. So you know, it's, there's room for uh, everybody's uh, taste in roses. It's um, it's wonderful, wonderful world to be in. We thank you so much, and Jill, um, our executive director, is with us. I think she's about to... Oh, there we go. Okay. I just want to reiterate our deep thanks to you, Michael. It has made me pine for spring and I think a trail of roses up a brick wall is there's nothing more beautiful. So um, I want to thank all of our participants and uh, if this uh, whetted your appetite for gardens, I hope uh, you join us for our Grand Homes and Gardens series. The next one is next week. So what a delightful way to spend the afternoon for us and hopefully the evening for you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, pleasure. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>